All right. Uh, so sorry for the, uh, the slow setup, but thank you for having me. I'm a, I'm a student at uh, Stanford, and I've been working uh, lately on software sandboxing and especially um, a project in classic software fault isolation. So I heard that you know this is a, a group that might be interested in um, general software sandboxing, and uh, so I hope you know even if this talk is a little bit more distant from WebAssembly from the others, uh, you still find it interesting. Um, and so thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, for the first part of the talk, I'm going to give an overview of uh, various techniques in software sandboxing. Um, in the second part, I'm going to talk about the the project that I've been working on called lightweight fault isolation. And then in part three, I'm going to I'll uh, you know talk about how uh, how I've been using LFI together with WebAssembly and, and how they compare and on trade offs and things like that. Um, okay, so um, isolation and sandboxing uh, is uh, something that's you know central to uh, a system where we want to isolate multiple programs and we want them to not be able to read each other's memory. Um, or, act, or you know, influence each other um, in any way. And so the, the, the classic approach for isolation is going to be a hardware-based approach. Um, so this is typically what operating systems use with um, an MMU and memory protection and um, privilege levels. And so, but uh, you, you, when you try to run many, many processes and you want to be context switching between them a lot, this approach sort of breaks down because um, the context switch time is too high um, and setting up the hardware uh, is, uh, is too expensive or, or requires special um, OS supports that might not always be available to user programs. Um, so uh, instead, we've uh, you know people have developed software-based approaches, and so um, the the two primary ones uh, that I know of are the language-based security approach, where um, you know you re rely on a, on a programming language to provide uh, isolation guarantees, or the classic software fault isolation approach, um, which I'll uh, I'll discuss both um, in more depth. Um, and so in this area, uh, we have you know challenges with overhead and trusted software, and you can really make a, a large list of uh, things you want in your software sandbox. So um, you want efficiency, security, but maybe you also want it to be easy to design, uh, you know, to, to design and implement it, or you want to have um, many, many uh, processes or, uh, in one address space. Um, you want it to be flexible in terms of how large the, the sandbox can, how much memory can be allocated to each sandbox, or, or what kind of source languages can be mapped. Um, these sandboxes, and then also maybe you want um, some sort of concept of a self-contained uh, program that can be run in the sandbox or um, targeting multiple architectures. Okay, so in the language-based security approach, um, you uh, it's sort of like a front-end uh, isolation uh, approach. So you enforce security properties in some high-level language or source language or some safe IR, um, and then you uh, you compile that. Once you compile that language um, down to machine code, you can be assured that it's going to be safe to run this um, because the language, uh, if you know that it was compiled from a certain language that has various language level properties, um, as long as you trust the compiler to you know, compile your program correctly, then those properties are maintained um, when the machine code is generated. Um, so this is great for portability and for being able to uh, enforce lots of uh, powerful types of uh, safety properties. Um, and this is like a, a very, this is a pretty common approach. Um, so WebAssembly is uh, by and large language-based security. And then, um, you know, there are things like eBPF and, and the Java Virtual Machine. Um, one of the difficulties with language-based security is uh, the size of uh, sort of the amount of code that you have to trust because um, you end up tr usually tr fully trusting the compiler that generated the binary. And so if you want an efficient binary to be generated, this often involves fully trusting LLVM or, uh, you know, somewhat complicated um, or fairly complicated uh, compiler infrastructure and tool chain. Um, you might also run into issues where it, you know it's it's complex to design a safe language and, and how how are you sure that it's safe and um, and you have to you know implement this new language in your uh, compiler backend and then also um, you might end up uh, you know having to map if you're using an IR map uh, elements of a higher higher level source language into the IR um, and uh, whether or not you can do that safely. Or easily might restrict the uh, the types of um, safety properties you can enforce. Um, so classic software-based fault isolation is uh, was an approach from the 90s um, that is sort of the, the the opposite, I guess, or it's the the backend approach to uh, verifying um, or to to uh, to being sure that a program is safe to run. Um, so instead of instead of uh, verifying or in the source language that whatever your uh, whatever your program does is is uh, isolated. Instead, we um, take the machine code and just uh, verify that it's safe to run 
um, and verify various properties about it by directly reading the machine code. And so generally what this means is that like before every load and store or any operation in the machine code that could uh, out access memory outside of the sandbox or somehow escape um, some security properties, you check that those are not that you know there's a, there's going to be some uh, that the code itself has uh, bounds checks or guards within it. And so um, this comes with two components. So first you have an untrusted compiler that generates binaries, and then you have a verifier that checks these binaries to make sure that um, the, the, the memory operations that, uh, that these uh, binaries perform are not accessing anything outside the sandbox. Um, and so this means that uh, it, the verifier is the only part, is the only trusted component, and it can often be written in uh, you know, fewer lines of code than um, a full compiler toolkit or something like that. Um, and then uh, in particular, I'm going to, uh, the, the project I've been working on is, uh, very, is focused especially on um, providing low overhead while supporting many tenants and providing um, a, a way to do it that's uh, simple to implement and doesn't require um, you know, maintenance of a large uh, compiler infrastructure. Um, so some, uh, like NACL is, a, is, is an example of a previous um, sandboxing approach that used uh, so, uh, the, the classic SFI um, uh, approach to sandboxing, although it did not focus on, I guess, uh, having thousands of tenants in, in, in one address space, for example. Um, okay, so uh, I have a little timeline of software sandboxing. Um, and so I think the key things for me that have changed recently are one, that position independent code is uh, much more common and um, compilers have much better for, much better support for position independent code nowadays. And then two, um, the ARM architecture is starting to see more broad adoption. So Apple has now moved you know, all their products to the ARM computers. And I'm presenting this, uh, these slides from an ARM computer. And then ARM is also now um, becoming more widespread on, in cloud providers. Um, and this is important because uh, the ARM architecture is especially amenable to efficient SFI, um, which I'm going to now uh, give details on. So um, LFI is, a, is an SFI system. Um, which supports you know tens of thousands of fan boxes in an address space, uh, has very low overhead um, and is simple to implement. So it doesn't require uh, modifying an existing uh, compiler um, to you know get these benefits and to to implement the sandbox. Um, and it, but it only targets ARM64, so this is a not not a portable approach. Okay. So um, first, I'll give a, a short overview of of uh, the ARM 64-bit architecture. So the key points um, for sandboxing, especially, are that one, it's a fixed width encoding. So uh, every instruction is four bytes. Um, this means that uh, you don't have to worry, like on x86, where you have a variable width encoding for instructions, you don't have to worry about um, the possibility that the program would jump into the middle of an instruction and therefore execute different instructions. So um, you know you can sort of uh, you can accurately disassemble the code because of this uh, fixed width encoding. Um, another key thing is that it has a large register file. Um, so you're given um, on an ARM computer 31 general purpose registers and a stack pointer. Um, and then uh, the last point is uh, there's good support for accessing 32-bit subsets of uh, registers. So um, you know if there's a register called X0, that's a 64-bit value, the W0 register is just the 32-bit subset of X0. Um, and then, especially important, there's also um, an addressing mode, which uh, which you take advantage of um, to make this uh, efficient sandbox. So the uh, the sandbox environment um, for LFI is uh, each, each uh, sandbox is given four gigabytes of uh, virtual memory, and then there's a four gigabyte guard pages between every sandbox. So you have you know some large address space, uh, you can, um, each sandbox roughly will take eight gigabytes, four gigabytes for the, the code and data, and four gigabytes for the guard. Um, and uh, the NMU is used to prevent, uh, you know, things like dynamic code generation. And this also requires that the programs be position independent because they could be loaded anywhere in the address space. Um, so how many how many sandboxes can you fit? Um, ARM has this sort of ARM has some weird details to it. Um, the, the most common value will be this 32K number. So if you have a 48-bit address space, uh, like 48-bit virtual addresses, you can fit 32,000 8-gigabyte sandboxes. Um, ARM actually has two page tables. One of them is dedicated to the kernel. So if you are willing or if you're able to control 
kernel and use the kernel page table. You can double the size of the address space. And then there's also extensions uh, for ARM that uh, extend the page size up to larger values and therefore can increase the size of the um, virtual address space to allow you to fit more sandboxes. Although generally this, uh, this feature does not seem to be widely available on lots of hardware. So uh, generally not really possible to use. Um, okay, so how is the uh, sandbox um, implemented? So there are some special uh, registers that are reserved for the use of the sandbox. Um, in particular, the sandbox base address, which is gonna store the, the, you know, the first address of the sandbox. And since every sandbox is aligned to four gigabytes, um, the bottom 32 bits of this uh, register will be all zeros. Um, and then we also have some special registers that uh, have some very, have various uh, you know, invariants. Um, so X18, for example, is uh, one invariant that we're gonna enforce is that it always contains a, an address within the sandbox. Um, and so that means that uh, it's safe to do a load of the address stored in X18, no matter what. You know, it's always safe to load from X18 because X18 is always guaranteed to contain an address within the sandbox. Okay, um, and it's always safe to branch to X18, um, et cetera. And, and, you know, we also have various other registers similarly um, that have, you know, similar invariants. So how can you modify X18 if, if it always has to contain um, a, a valid sandbox address? Um, you can't just move into it from some random uh, register because this, this register might contain anything. Um, so what you do is uh, you can, what we really wanna do is take the bottom 32 bits of X0 and combine them with the top 32 bits of um, X21. So what this does is effectively, if you combine these two 32 bit values, the resulting address is uh, gonna be within the four gigabyte sandbox because the top 32 bits are sort of the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the base of the sandbox, like the, the base address of the sandbox, plus whatever offset within that sandbox, um, whatever 32-bit offset within the four gigabyte sandbox, this, this X0 address uh, referred to before. Um, so this, uh, this ARM instruction adds, um, it performs a, a truncation of um, X0 down to 32 bits, zero extends it, and then adds it with X21. And so this single instruction um, basically takes any value in uh, in the X0 register, so any, any pointer could be outside the sandbox, could be anything, um, and forces it with a sort of wrapping behavior, forces it back into the sandbox. Um, so we can use this to uh, implement uh, safe loads or safe uh, indirect branches. Um, so first, if you want to, if you originally, you were just gonna like an unsandboxed code, you would branch to the contents of a, a register. Now um, you first uh, safely Con uh, convert that register into an, a valid sandbox address and then store it in X18 and branch that. And you can do similar things for loads um, and you know, whenever you modify the return address, things like this. Um, and so the important thing about these reserved registers is that uh, the skipping the guards is legal, right? If you just jump directly to this instruction and you skip over the guard, since X18 is always guaranteed to contain a valid address, um, this is still a safe instruction to execute. Um, and uh, yeah, I should note also, so the, these invariants are gonna be verified by the verifier. Okay, so I've showed similar, or I've shown simple um, addressing modes. ARM actually has a bunch of addressing modes. Um, and so some of them have to be, some of them are safe due to guard pages. Some of them have to be rewritten like these complicated register, register addressing modes, which add two registers together to uh, form the final address. Um, but I wanna bring your attention to this addressing mode in particular which uh, is essentially um, what it does is it truncates this value um, down to 32 bits, zero extends it, adds it to XN, and then has a, an optional shift. And then that is the address um, used to perform the load or store. And so if we set this uh, shift value to be zero, forget about the shift, this is essentially a guard, uh, like a, the, the guard instruction in the addressing mode, um, directly in the addressing mode. So that means we can actually rewrite loads to use this uh, addressing mode guard directly, um, and this is a safe this is a safe instruction to execute. No matter uh, what is no matter what address was originally in XN, um, this is now safe to execute and will uh, you know not not be able to load outside the sandbox. And this conversion um, actually has zero uh, additional cycles of overhead, um, so we can use this to rewrite all the addressing modes um, and decrease the number of cycles of overhead that previously we needed. Uh, an extending add each time, which was two cycles. Um, now we can use 
the, the guarded addressing mode with a non-extending ad, which is only one cycle for some of the more complicated uh, addressing modes. Um, so this decreases the amount of overhead substantially, especially since basic loads and basic, like basic loads essentially are the most common um, form of load and the basic addressing mode is the most common one. Um, so another optimization um, that you can do is, uh, is a form of hoisting. So in this original unsandboxed code, um, all the, the uh, you know, these X1 is uh, accessed several times and each time naively would need, uh, would need a guard for it. Um, uh, what you can do instead is use additional reserved registers to um, just perform the guard once and then hoist that guard above and, uh, and then each of these registers are safe to access. Um, and uh, don't need, you don't need a guard per, per load when you're accessing the same um, register over and over again. Also, uh, so another optimization is for the stack pointer. Um, you know, we have the same sort of assumption or invariant that we have for x18 with the stack pointer. It always needs to contain a valid address. Um, so that way we're not needing to guard stack accesses. Um, whenever you, this means that whenever you modify the stack pointer, you need some sort of, uh, some sort of instruction uh, sequence to push the stack pointer back into the range of the sandbox. And you can't use the extending add because um, the extending add is not encodable with the stack pointer directly. So it takes two instructions. However, there are some optimizations you can make. So for example, if you load from the stack pointer within the same basic block as the modification to the stack pointer, you can be guaranteed that it'll either be valid or it'll have moved into uh, a guard page um, and therefore will trap. Okay, so one other thing that I wanna do with Sandbox is um, make a runtime call. So you wanna call out to the, to the runtime and you wanna do so safely. And one approach would be to reserve yet another register and just store the runtime entry point in that register and then jump to the, the runtime entry point whenever uh, you wanna make a runtime call. But that's another, yet another reserved register. Um, so what you can, another approach is to uh, use the first page of the sandbox to store a table of uh, function calls or uh, function pointers um, that correspond to the runtime calls. And this, this address is actually already stored in X21, right? X21 stores the basic breadth of the sandbox. Um, and X30 is a special register that is uh, used only for valid branch targets. So you can rewrite something like a system call or a runtime call into this sequence that stores the return address on the stack loads the function pointer from the runtime call table, indirect branches to it, and then restores the, uh, the return address. And um, this doesn't need any trampolines. So again, we don't need alignment requirements and we avoid um, store or reserving another register just for this purpose. Okay, so one of the problems I was running into was how can I implement this without modifying a uh, compiler tool chain because um, I'm, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not really able to maintain um, the modifications necessary over time to, to, to have it be useful um, long-term. Um, so uh, what I've done instead has been using a text processing pass. So it just operates directly on assembly files, .s files produced by you know, the compiler. Um, and the, and uh, the, the result is just a, a simple 2000 line program, which does a, a parses the GNU assembly inserts the additional guards, and then produces a new assembly file back, which can be then assembled by the compiler. Um, and the you know, GNU assembly has some intricacies that are sort of annoying. Um, and luckily there's this LLVM MC tool, which uh, normalizes .s files. So it will resolve um, like GNU macros, and it will resolve expressions and things like that. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, so, uh, a full LLVM uh, toolchain that uses LFI requires a bunch of libraries. So these all need to be compiled with the uh, LFI compiler uh, or uh, you know, the, the wrapper around Clang or around uh, GCC, which, uh, which, has, which inserts this .s file rewriting pass. Uh, and then once you have all these libraries, you compile with, uh, you, you, all you need is, you just need the program you're gonna link with and uh, it will be, um, you know, safe to run within an LFI sandbox. Um, GCC is um, more annoying to deal with because of the build system. So currently there's only an LLVM um, tool chain, but this could be, I think, easily extended uh, to include GCC. So the static verifier uh, is uh, a short program written in Rust. Um, and 
since there are no alignment requirements, all it has to do is go through, look at, uh, make sure reserve registers are only modified in legal ways and make sure that loads and stores only happen to reserve registers. And so it can verify quickly and it's not very hard to write. And uh, one thing that's been a, a help um, in writing this verifier is ARM produces this machine readable specification, which is basically a bunch of XML files describing every instruction in the ARM instruction set. And uh, along with some code that describes their operation and some information about their encoding. And so I think it would be interesting at some point to try to fully generate the verifier from the, the machine readable specification. But for now, I've just been using it as, as a way of sort of finding all instructions that uh, branch and or read write memory or modify register sort of the instructions you need to know about to to write the, ver the verifier properly and uh, use those uh, use you know the the that list of instructions just to double check that the verifier is correct manually um, so now I have some some numbers for the overhead uh, in particular uh, here is this enables various optimizations that I was talking about. So on 0 there are no optimizations. It just uses the two cycle extending add instruction. Um, on 01, it uses the uh, the 32 bit addressing mode to speed things up. And so you can see that's the big performance. So on average on spec 2017, this this brings the the overhead down from around 20% to around 8%. Uh, and then uh, 02 includes uh, the, the the guard hoisting optimization, which gets you about another percent. So um, that brings you down to about 7%. Now, um, so WebAssembly is a sort of the language-based approach, but the language-based approach is really nice because it provides this portability uh, factor. And so uh, WebAssembly provides, it, it links portability and isolation together. Um, you have the, the nice uh, sort of self-contained IR uh, binary and you can recompile it for many different architectures um, but uh, it also links directly in the isolation so you get bounds checks or dynamic indirect branch checks things like that uh, and so one thing I'm interested in is trying to decouple these two and use WebAssembly just as a portable IR and for example LFI as the underlying isolation mechanism and see you know what are the benefits of this and uh, and how much it costs to do this in terms of overhead um, so I have some, I ran spec uh, again uh, with some of these, uh, well, some of these WebAssembly engines. Um, in particular, the important ones are uh, for this that I modified are W2C2. So this does not perform full sandboxing. Um, it, I, it has the dynamic indirect branch checks stripped out to try to increase performance because I also have this W2C2 LFI version, which runs WebAssembly within an LFI sandbox. So now LFI guarantees the isolation component and um, W2C2 just uh, lets you run, you know, arbitrary WebAssembly uh, modules. Um, okay, so um, here are the measurements. Um, essentially, uh, what I've measured is these are all like ahead of time, except for wasm time. But uh, the you get around 25% or 30% overhead from using WebAssembly, and uh, the the benefit of uh, I guess. Using uh, using LFI on top of W2C2 causes an additional 20% overhead. Uh, so that's interesting because usually you you know the, the normal measurement is only 7% by default. So I think this is from WebAssembly using a lot of these uh, complicated addressing modes more often because it's adding the base address to like linear memories uh, all over the place. And so then you're spending the full two cycles every time anyway uh, to to safely sandbox that um, that type of uh, mode or addressing mode but you still get the benefit of uh when you run you know when you run WebAssembly within an lfi container you get the benefit of a, a smaller tcd and the ability to maybe safely pre-compile so you can pre-compile your WebAssembly, and you can be um you don't have to be concerned about the fact that uh that you have to be trusting the compiler or um somehow using like compiler hashes or signatures to uh, be sure that the that a trusted compiler generated it and the indirect branch removal for W2C2, this is only really helpful on this benchmark in particular, which seems to be um, especially sort of problematic for indirect branches, but the others don't have this uh, characteristic. Um, I was also trying to uh, optimize WebAssembly as much as possible to try to figure out where the overheads come from. So uh, one thing is certainly the SIMD128 proposal helps, especially for this benchmark in particular. Uh, and 
it's kind of interesting because in WebAssembly, you've got the first uh, pass, which translates to the WASM IR, and that's where the SIMD128 proposal happens. But then you've got the backend pass, which translates from the IR to the machine code. And even without SIMD128, that still can use auto vectorization. Um, so, so it's it's it is interesting that uh, that the vectorization on the front end, um, you know, it, that is clearly doing some work um, that the the subsequent backend compiler would not have otherwise been able to recover some information there. Um, the other thing I was I tested was to reserve a register for the linear memory heat base, um, and so that also gave like a about a five percent um, improvement in the overhead. Um, but yeah, so uh, that's the end of the talk. Um, you can you can uh, find the code online, and uh, thank you for having me. We do have time for questions. Go ahead. Do we need a mic? Or we should do the mic. Yeah. Is this audible? Hope so. Um, another way of uh, ensuring safety would be to use hardware capabilities. Have you thought about that at all? Yeah. So certainly, I, I would be interested in using hardware capabilities. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I think you know current hardware does not provide really the the necessary uh, checks or the necessary capabilities. Like really, there's just the the hardware MMU, which is uh, too slow to uh, modify or you know having to flush the TLB having to use privilege modes in order to to, to, to use the MMU properly requires you know a, a costly context switch um, so uh, but it, so it's sort of like arm the arm architecture is is more um, you know designed towards I think being amenable to SFI but I think you could go even more uh, you know down that route of hardware uh, specialization well, arm in particular has some experimental hardware that builds in Hardware capabilities, the, the Morello. Cherry. Cherry, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So it would be cool to see that being more widely used, um, certainly. In the um, uh, the overhead comparisons, I'm curious can, can you say a bit more about? the configurations of the runtimes that you're comparing in particular are you using guard pages oh yeah so I'm, I'm using yeah i'm using guard pages so uh, all these uh, runtimes are not doing any bounds checks uh, okay yeah it's it's, everything's getting a four gigabyte even with guard pages but if i understand correctly one downside to this approach is that you always have to have four gigabytes and within that the, so if, if you want to implement WebAssembly semantics that require you to trap on an out-of-bounds access in the linear memory heap, then you have to do that in um, uh, w with explicit bounds checks. Yeah, so if you want, uh, I guess, like, if you're using, if you have the 4 gigabyte region, you can be sure in WebAssembly, at least, that you're not going to access outside of it, so you don't, so you don't need to be um, trapping. But otherwise, yes, uh, you need to... Um, this is sort of ignoring that component. Yeah. Uh, okay. and, and you need to make sure that there's four gigabytes of virtual memory available for each, uh, or really eight gigabytes of virtual memory available for each module. Thanks. Ostensibly, I should have a mic. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, uh... there we go. Now it's, uh, so you had a chart that I was trying to follow. Uh, how much of the perf loss was from bounce checking and how much was from the dynamic branch? In stuff? this chart? Yeah. Um, so none of so, these... so the reason I'm asking is because ARM has hardware that could help you with, like today, like your MacBook has hardware that could help you with uh, CFI for the indirect branches. And it sounded like that was the bigger perf hit. Um, so I think the, at least, so LFI is, I guess bounds checking is kind of a, an overloaded term. Uh, the, in, in certain ways, the, the guarded addressing mode and the, the, the guard instruction is a bounds check, although it's not doing like a branch or anything. So like WebAssembly is not doing any bounds checks, but it's still having to add this base, which is essentially the same thing as the guard instruction. So um, that, in some ways, that's a bounds check. And I think that's accounting for roughly like 7% overhead. Uh, the indirect branches, I think, are accounting for 
Um, very little overhead in most of these benchmarks, but there's this MCF benchmark in particular where you can see, like, um, you know, the, these, uh, for example, the, the blue here is Wasm to C, and then W2C2 is the only WebAssembly engine that's not doing the indirect browse check, and it gains a lot. But on the other benchmarks, it's, it's not gaining very much from this. So I think the, um, I think the indirect uh, branch, it depends a lot on the workload. Yeah, hopefully that answered your question. 